welcome. Those of you who are new, my name is Jeff Long. I serve as the lead pastor here. Look forward to sharing the word with you today. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you turn there in your Bible, if you don't have a copy of the Bible with you, there's one under a chair close by you. We're on page 952. Uh, I hope and pray that this week you took advantage of the study guide. If you did, you saw how even the music today was pointing us to the things we studied and thought about and, and prayed through and looked at in the Word. Those are available out in the lobby. They're also available, will be uh, emailed to you. And if you would download the Parkwood app, uh, they're available there. And if it's not already done in the next few days, there's going to be a typable PDF there where you can actually type on top of it and do your notes uh, in uh, that fashion. We also have these uh, scripture journals available. This is only 1 Corinthians, this little book. One side's the text, the other side is a blank page, a great way to take and keep your notes from sermons or while you're studying together. It'd be a great reference uh, to hold on to. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 today, these foundational verses that will lead us through the rest of 1 Corinthians. Let's stand together as Andrew comes to read. First Corinthians 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you, in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we praise you and thank you that you have been gracious to each one of us. Lord, you have called us out of this world and into fellowship with your Son. You have washed us clean from all our sin and declared us as your own. You have enriched us with every spiritual blessing. You are the one who sustains us and you will sustain us to the end. We thank you, Lord, for these undeserved blessings. And as we come now as your church, as your people, to, to study your word, to hear from you, we come with grateful and eager hearts. We ask that you would speak to us now, that you would edify your church. We pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Many of you have moved to this area from somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world, and uh, several of you will come up sometimes and say, I'm not quite sure what that phrase meant. So if, if I were writing 1 Corinthians, it would start with this line. I'm fixing the light into you. Now let me translate that if you're not from here. Fixing to means I'm getting ready to and light into you. Well, you can just figure that out. I'm getting ready to light you up. That's probably how I would have written it. Um, you may be like me, a little wound tight and straightforward and somewhat aggressive when it comes to addressing something. Something to be learned here. Because something needs to be said to these people. It's some serious, serious issues. And, and he's going to get to dealing with them. But he starts in a very specific way. And, and it's, it's not just he's being nice, brothers and sisters. That's, that's not it. It's not, I'm going to say something nice so I can say something strong. He's being theological. Paul's reminding himself and the Corinthians as he begins this letter. It's a hopeful tone, a grateful tone. 
He's celebrating God's grace in their lives. He's focusing on the work of God, not the failure of the Corinthians. It's not an accident that in in a letter that he says, "I, I preach Christ and Him crucified, that in the opening nine verses, he refers to Jesus ten times. Hope you didn't miss that. I boxed them all in red as I was working through in the, the Bible that I study with. He's saying this, by grace you have been called, by grace you are enriched, and by grace you will be sustained. So here's the main idea today, that all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are enriched and will be sustained to the end by His grace. That's mainly found in verses 4 through 9, but we have this, this greeting, this opening to the letter. But it's not just a simple greeting, it's a purposeful, grace-filled greeting. It's from the author who is Paul, who describes himself this way, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. We saw Sosthenes last week in Acts 7, 18, 17, the ruler of the synagogue that was seized in Corinth, around this controversy surrounding Paul as he was there. We're not told that Sosthenes comes to faith in Acts 18, but you would assume and likely that this is the same person because the Corinthians knew who he was, our brother Sosthenes. He's serving as the purpose of Paul's companion and a person who was writing down 1 Corinthians for on Paul's behalf, a secretary, if you will. Paul says, I'm called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, we have a record of how this happened. Saul, who was trained as a Pharisee, was livid about these people professing to believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was so overcome by it that he set his mission to rid rid every synagogue of anybody who claimed to be a Christian. He got approval and he was on his way to the synagogues in Damascus, which is in modern-day Syria, north of Israel. He went there in order to find people who were proclaiming to be Christians and to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. On his way, the Lord Jesus intervenes. He appears to him in a vision and he says, Saul, Saul, why Are you persecuting me? Now, Jesus is not physically there. He's ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. What does Jesus mean when he says, why are you persecuting me? It's a part of the foundation of what we're going to look at today. The church is the body of Christ. And when you persecute the church, you persecute Jesus. And that's what Paul is, Jesus is saying to Saul at that time. He opens his eyes to see by first blinding him physically. He opens his eyes to see the hope of the gospel, and Saul is transformed. And right away, in Acts chapter 9, he begins to preach the gospel in Damascus in the, in the synagogue. And everybody is astounded because they know why he came there. That he's now preaching that Jesus is the way to salvation. Now, here's what he's saying to the Corinthians. I've been called by the will of God. I've been summoned by the will of God. That this summoning lies deep within the plans and the purpose of God himself. In other words, Paul wasn't walking on the road to Damascus having a conversation with himself. You know what? I'm thinking about going into ministry. I'm thinking about becoming a Christian. No, he's dead set on his way to Damascus to get rid of Christians, and God intervenes. That's the only way I can explain my salvation. God intervened. I was on a path bound for destruction. Now, if you're a person here, you think, well, I've always been a pretty good person. I've always been a Christian. Well, you don't understand the Bible. Much less understand yourself. There is not a person in this room who has not been saved by grace. No one. Which leads us to the recipients. Paul here is going to describe the Corinthian church from God's perspective. Now he could have explained it from a man perspective. 
Church was full of cliques, people following this, church, this pastor and this pastor, claiming that I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter. There was a lot of snobbery going on when they'd get together for fellowship meals. The rich people stayed together and the poor people stayed together. There was very little church discipline. Sin was abounding in morals and doctrine. They were unwilling to submit to authority of any kind. The integrity of Paul's apostleship was called into question. There was a distinct lack of humility, a, no consideration for others. Some were even prepared and were actually dragging other believers into court to sue them. They celebrated continually their newfound freedom in Jesus without the slightest regard for anyone else. And here's what they celebrated most. Spiritual gifts. These people were a mess. But Paul greets them, and here's what he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. That's not a denomination, by the way. That's not what he meant. To the gathering. The word ecclesia is a gathering. And there would have been other ecclesias. And we think in the word church now, there would have been other ecclesias in Corinth. There would have been gatherings of all these other pagan groups. There would have been political gatherings. And he's saying to this gathering, you are the church of God in Corinth. He doesn't say you're my church or your church. As best as any human could have been involved, Paul was a part of how this church came to be. But he doesn't say this is my church. He says this is the church of God. He's writing to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is a positional statement. Who we are in Christ. That we have been set apart by God. That we are in union with Christ. That we are, we are in Him. That Christ is in us and we are in Him. Him, the you here is it's plural, to those, to those of you who are sanctified in Christ. We need to keep this in mind here. He is looking at the church as it is in Christ before he talks about anything else that's going on among them. And even when he gets to the point that he's going to address and is addressing these difficult places, chapters 5 through 6, Five and six are the most difficult part of the, of the entire epistle. And right square in the middle of that, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, here's what he says. And such were some of you. He's describing all these sinful behaviors. And he's saying, that was true of you before. But here's who you are. You were washed. It means you're cleansed of your sin. You were sanctified. You were set apart by God. And you were justified. You were declared righteous. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of God. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. Now the word summoned here, it doesn't mean he invited you. He summoned you. Summoned to be saints together. So if I made my way around as you were coming in today and I said, do you consider yourself a saint? Don't answer out loud. I, I've, 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 I've played this game in Gastonia before. I start this way. Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. Are you a saint? Oh, no, no, no. If you're here and you're, you're Catholic today, I'm not trying to be offensive to you. I'm trying to teach the difference to this congregation between us and what Catholics believe. Uh, we do not believe you arrive at sainthood. We believe that the Bible teaches all Christians are saints. All Christians are holy ones. And that is of God. It is God who washed. It is God who sanctified. It is God who justified. He is the one who has declared us holy. We are summoned by Him. And we are His saints. Together. We don't live in isolated lives. We are distinguished from the rest of the world and that we are called into the body of Christ 
And we are to reflect Him in who we are and what we say and what we do. He says, with all those in every place, call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So he's saying this is true not only in Corinth, this is true of the church of all time, of everyone who calls on Jesus Christ for salvation and has been delivered from the wrath of God. So as a result, he says, grace to you. So what you have not earned or deserve, grace to you. And as a result of what you have not earned or deserve, you have peace. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as a result of these foundational truths, now Paul's going to move deeper into the understanding of God's grace and the application of His grace in the lives of the followers of Christ together in His church. He first makes it clear that all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are enriched by His grace. So this section of thanksgiving is not simply about him being nice to the Corinthians before launching into criticism. It reflects the grace of God that is at work in Paul. By God's grace, the Lord is causing him to know how to give thanks even when there are things that disturb him about the church at Corinth. He's learned to look for what God is doing among his people. Something we must all learn as Christians. About a month ago in our elders meeting, it was a very difficult meeting. There's multiple cases of church discipline and sin in the lives of people in this church were discussed as we were praying and seeking the Lord. I intentionally that afternoon wrote out everywhere I could think of, I saw the grace of God at work in our church. And it was a joyful way we ended that elders meeting. Saying, thanks be to God. Look at what he's doing among his people. I didn't learn that on my own. I learned it right here. I learned it from the Bible. That we need to give thanks to God always. Why? Why? Because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Now, I dare say, well over 90% of you, when you read the word you, you hear me. That's not what he means. The you is plural. I give thanks to my God always for you. The church of God that is in Corinth. And those who are in every place. Why? Because of the grace of God that was given you. The source of his gratitude is the effect of God's grace in their lives. This is similar to what happened when Barnabas went to Antioch. It's recorded in Acts chapter 11. In verse 23 it says, When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. He saw the evidence of God's undeserved work among the people in Antioch and that God had saved some and called together his church and those people he exhorted to remain faithful to the Lord with a steadfast purpose. So here's the question I have then. How is the grace of God which is given received? Ephesians chapter 2. Our brothers expounded this verse a few weeks ago in a tremendous way. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, I'm about to do something that's going to nut some of you up. That's another Gastonia thing. Sorry, drive you crazy. He does not say, for by grace you've been saved through accepting him. Now, I push back from the phrase accept him because I fear some of you think you're doing something. Now, here's why I push back, because of what it says in this text. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is what? This is not of your doing. You didn't do this. It is the gift of God. 
That means everything involved here. Salvation, faith, it is the gift of God. It is not the result of works. Why? Why? What does it say? So no one can boast. We are saved by grace through faith. By trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. In the last service, our brother Terry was baptized. And the testimony was given before his baptism that even though he'd been in church for many years, in recent months, God has opened his eyes to understand that he was believing he brought something to the table in his salvation. And he came to understand by God's grace that salvation is all of Christ. And with joy, this brother stood and proclaimed his faith in Jesus among us today. And for all who have been saved by grace through faith, here's what's true. We are his workmanship created, same word as in, or idea is in Genesis 1, that God's created something. Not, he not improved something. He's created something. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now that brings us back to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. That in every way, You were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift. Prosperity preachers love this next phrase, but we got to get it in context. Enriched in Him. It literally means in every way He's made you wealthy. This is not a reference here at this point in time to resources. This is a reference to what the struggle was in Corinth. Here's what they were looking for. They were looking for preachers with a pedigree who had a big resume. You'll notice two things that doesn't happen here. Number one, if we have a guest preacher, we don't read his resume. Ever noticed? The only thing he needs to bring is the book. Preach the word. Who cares where you came from? And when I preach somewhere, I don't let them read my resume because it means nothing and I don't have much of one. We don't base whether or not somebody is bringing the word based off their background. Now, if somebody gets up here and mangles the word because they don't know the word, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And he ought not to be back here, wherever here is. But here's what we know, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. So God has given to his church the gifts that the church needs. Verse 7, you are not lacking in any gift. Now they were tempted to boast in their gifts, but Paul is drawing attention to the source of the gift. It's God. You are enriched in him. The the, the gifts that God has given to his church are the riches of his grace. And when he says, you are not lacking in any gifts, he's not talking about me personally. I lack gifts. And so do you individually. But we, Parkwood, don't lack. This is a promise of God. That we do not lack any gift. All Christians are gifted. And no gift is greater than another. 1 Corinthians Chapter 12 will make it clear that each one has a grace gift, an undeserved gift. It's not a talent. Some of you were born able to sing. That's not a spiritual gift. It's a talent. You say, well, it's given by God. Yes. But that's not a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is for the purpose of the building up of the body of Christ. They're very distinct, and they're recorded in the Scripture. And each one of us are gifted For what the body needs. And none will be lacking. So the Lord will see to it that we have what we need. So let me just make it clear to you. As I speak to the gifted body of Christ. The need right now. We have four classes in our kids area. Four. 
from elementary school down to preschool, four classes that need two teachers in each of them. Our ladies have exhausted and requested and asked all, ask all the people they know. But here's what I know. Here's what we know. God's gifted and set apart people in, in this church to, to step forward. Now here's what I need to say to you. Some of you are going, well, I'm new here. Well, if you've become a member here, you're new here, and we need you. Here's why. Because next Sunday, 75 people are going to stand on this platform who are going to leave here to plant a new church in Mount Holly. All of those people are serving somewhere. The reason we have four empty rooms is because some of them represent the leaders who have had to move on to something else. God will always backfill what we need. Right now, we need to start eight adult growth groups. Eight. It means we need eight leaders. We need eight homes. <laughs> Here's what I've found about people's homes. I'm going to go from preaching to meddling. Is that okay? <laughs> Hospitality is a gift, but it's also a command. Giving is a gift, and it's also a a command. <clears throat> Gastonia does not have 200,000 museums. It's got 200,000 homes. Stop treating the place you live like a museum. Let me rebuke one more thing while I'm at it. Well, I just don't like kids in my house. Take that one up with Jesus. Who said, suffer not the little children to come to me. <laughs> one thing we have here is lots of children. Praise God. Praise God that families are coming here. And together, we are to meet these needs. This word enriched shows up in 2 Corinthians. He says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way through, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. He's talking here about financial resources. So next Sunday, I told you already, at the end of the service, we're going to pray over 70-some people who are going to Mount Holly to start Redemption Hill Church. At the beginning of the service, we'll be sharing about expanding our lobby and how leaders met last night. And how they've committed in an incredibly generous way. And call on the rest of the church to partner together. It is God who supplies. It's God who supplies. And we trust Him to provide for His church. And how long do we trust Him to do this? Until He comes. Because the next major thing you see is that all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will be sustained to the end by His grace. He, he could have focused on the failures. He doesn't. He focuses on the reality, the truth, that Christ's work on their behalf is more foundational to who they are than what they have done to damage things or where they have failed. He says, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end? Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ in the day, we're waiting and longing for the day, the day of Christ. Until that day comes, he will sustain you to the end. This is the same word that's translated confirmed in verse 6. It's a legal metaphor that the Corinthians and all who are in Christ, who are here today, and throughout time, you will be confirmed in this sense. You have been pronounced not guilty. You are blameless. You will appear before the Lord God at the last judgment. That is the end. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Why? God is faithful. 
God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The God who called the Corinthians into fellowship with Christ will see to it that the initial call is not nullified or canceled. This makes the word make sense because of the word calling that Paul refers to an effective call, a call that creates faith. And since God effectively summons people to believe, he will sustain that belief until the end. So let me just be clear, because sometimes people think I'm saying something out of both sides of my mouth. I'm not. If, If your salvation depends on you, ultimately, at the end... You're the one deciding whether you're a Christian or not. If if it ultimately just lies with you, then you could decide not to be one. Logically, right? But if salvation is a work of God, how can you undo what God has done? You cannot. And what God has started, God will finish. So I'm not really sure about that. Let me repeat this very simple verse one more time. He who began a good work in you, who started it, will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God for his faithfulness. Jude records it this way, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. So where's your confidence? Where's your confidence personally? Where's your confidence for this church? When you're watching the news right now, Where is your confidence for the church worldwide? Here's my question. Am I trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me rephrase it. Are we trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's go to Romans chapter 10. If you've been a Christian very long, you've been around the church, this is a very foundational text. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. Saved. You will be. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Now that's a summary statement right there that what, what Paul is getting to is that you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, that He became sin for you, that He took what you deserved on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sin, that He was buried, He died and was buried, and three days later He was raised from the grave. This proving that He is Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, declared righteous, And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What does it say on the coming of Jesus, Philippians chapter 2? When Jesus comes, what are we going to confess? That Jesus is Lord. Then the scripture says this. For the scripture says, verse 11, everyone who believes in him will not be what? And what does all this mean? Here's what I think. This is based on my pastoral experience and hundreds of conversations. I think many of you believe that saved means that God makes you a better person. That is not what it means. Saved has everything to do with the day. You are going to die Or Jesus is going to return before your death. And there is coming a day when you are going to stand before Him. And on that day, everyone who has confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart, 
that God raised Jesus from the dead, they will be saved from the wrath of God. They will not be ashamed. Why not? You you think I'm going to stand there on that day and say, Lord, I pastored, I tried really hard. You think that's going to count for anything? Do you? Some of you looking at me like you don't know the answer. I'm going to tell you, it counts for nothing. Nothing. The only thing that matters on the day is that Jesus Christ gave his life for us. That he died in our place. Died and they buried him. And three days later he rose again. And all who look to him and believe will be saved on the day. Oh, do you believe? Do you believe? Are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? If you have never professed Christ, if you're like Terry who was in church forever, who was trusting in his own good works, a little bit of Jesus, but his good works too, repent of that and turn to Christ today and cry out to him to save your soul. Now listen, here's what's really crucial with verse 11. Look at it again. It says, everyone who, what? Notice it's not an E-D on the end, it's E-S. Everyone who believes, present, active. This is how you know who are his. His people believe. Believe. It's not that they walked an aisle 30 years ago, got baptized, and went right back to the way they were living. His people believe. They believe. They believe in Him. And His people will not be put to shame. Why? Why? Just listen. When I fear my faith may fail, He will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He will hold me fast. For my life, he bled and died. He will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. Forever. He will hold me fast. Till our faith be turned to sight. When he shall come at last. Let's pray. Would I plead now? I plead that this will be a song of faith. song of those who believe present active believe for those who cannot make this claim oh holy spirit fall on them now prompt them with the courage to speak now with someone either as we sing or as immediately after this service to further pursue what it means to be a believer in Jesus For those of you who have opened their eyes, may they turn to you even now. And Lord, I pray for your church, your people gathered in your name in this place, those whom you have sanctified, those who are your saints together. May they declare as one that you will hold us fast. Lead us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.